everybody. Welcome to this event. I am very pleased to welcome Catherine Machalaba to Dartmouth to talk to us about Zika, Ebola, and other emerging diseases, exploring animal and environmental connections to human health. Catherine is the program coordinator for health and policy at the nonprofit organization called Eco Health Alliance. Her research focuses on advancing coordinated and preventive systems that promote human, animal, and environmental health, given their integral links. Under the USAID Merging Pandemic Threats Predict2 product, projects, she is currently analyzing the effectiveness of One Health approaches. She also manages the Future Health Project under Future Earth International Scientific Platform on Global Environmental Change and holds roles in the IUCN Species Survival Commission and at the American Public Health Association. Her prior work includes West Nile virus surveillance with the Vermont Department of Health and an internship with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. Catherine holds an undergraduate degree in biology from Wake Forest University and an MPH from the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Please join me in welcoming Catherine. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here and your interest in this topic. Uh, Zika virus is obviously very timely and um, you know there are a lot of concerns about it, a lot of research that's still to be done on it. Um, and by no means am I an expert on Zika virus. Zika virus is very new, there are very few experts, but I'll tell you what I know um, and hopefully be able to provide some information that, that's useful um, and then also get into kind of the, you know, why we're seeing these outbreaks and what we can do about it. So what is Zika virus? It's an, uh, it's an arbovirus, which is an arthropod-borne virus, so it's from the Aedes mosquito. Um, it's a day biter, so unlike malaria, which bites at night, uh, the risk is during the daytime. Um, it's a flavivirus, so from the family of viruses that includes West Nile virus, yellow, fever, dengue, um, and it was first discovered in 1947, so it's actually not so new. It was discovered in a monkey in Uganda in the Zika forest. Um, and then shortly after, it was discovered in mosquitoes. But this zoonotic link, you know, the potential link to an animal is not known. There hasn't been a lot of good evidence subsequently about uh, an origin in uh, an animal species. Until 2007, there were very few human cases. And then in 2007, something kind of unusual happened. There was an outbreak in Micronesia, um, and it was thought that there was some genetic recombination event that enabled this uh, sudden outbreak. So Zika virus disease, most infections are mild or asymptomatic, so many infections go unnoticed. It's thought that about one in four is um, you know, symptomatic and it's often very mild. Uh, so you may see fever, rash, it's usually a low-grade fever, uh, unlike in dengue fever, which is usually a higher-grade fever, so that's a kind of differential um, symptom of it. And it can lead to joint pain, ocular disorders, headache, um, and probably many other conditions that just haven't been associated yet because you know, we're still uh, learning more about this virus. Severe man manifestations have been what's really caught the public's <laughs> attention. So there is now scientific consensus that it can lead to microcephaly, which I'll discuss in more detail, um, and other fetal disorders and Guillain-Barre syndrome. And there's no specific treatment or vaccine at this point, just supportive therapy. So microcephaly is the appearance of a, a, a head that's smaller than would be expected. And you can have kind of different uh, grades of this. You can have microcephaly and then severe microcephaly. Uh, it can lead to... Uh, long-term complications, including seizures, developmental and cognitive disabilities, um, and it's usually diagnosed in pregnancy or after birth. There are many causes, and that's kind of what's made it really challenging to associate it with Zika immediately, um, and there were some questions in the scientific community about whether there was a direct link. Um, so some other infections can cause microcephaly and malnutrition and toxin exposure, um, but now there's a, a pretty clear link that there is um, a, a pretty clear consensus that there's a link to Zika virus. So transmission of Zika virus is uh, primarily from the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Other mosquito, mosquito species may transmit it, but this seems to be the most comp competent vector. Um, as of now, 61 countries have reported mosquito-borne infections, and then nine are also reporting person-to-person -person transmission. And this is um, via a few different routes, but now we've seen that it can be transmitted via sexual contact, 
blood transfusions, although quite rare, um, and then also via a pregnant woman to her fetus. Uh, the CDC recommends uh, several kind of general prevention strategies which are consistent with other mosquito-borne uh, diseases, so avoiding mosquito bites, um, and then being aware when you travel to regions that may um, have sustained infection in mosquito populations, and then pregnant women are advised to take additional precautions when traveling. So Zika is really uh, kind of a, a new concern in the Americas, and, and this map goes back to 2011, and we can see very few countries were reporting infections of, with uh, Zika virus, and then all of a sudden there was this really big uh, reporting of Zika just in the past few months, and the research on Zika kind of follows this trend. So. Um, we're seeing a lot of new research, but still a lot of questions to be answered. And the, um, the increase in cases has primarily been in the Americas. So if we look back to the history of Zika virus, we, we know that it first was detected in uh, 1947, and then very few cases uh, you know, in the immediate years after that. In 1952, we saw the first human case in uh, Uganda and Tanzania. Then it kind of spread to um, the Southeast Asia, but really rarely seen. And then in 2007, we saw that big increase in cases in Micronesia. Um, then it kind of spread further along and, and made its way to Easter Island um, in 2013, 2014. And then all of a sudden in Brazil in 2015, there were reports of this undiagnosed illness, and it was thought to be linked to other diseases, so measles, um, dengue, but these tests were all negative. Um, and Zika wasn't suspected in this case, in, in, at this time. Then uh, move ahead a year, and we see that now there, there's this public health um, emergency as designated by the World Health Organization, and it's now known that this, uh, this virus is linked to Zika virus. So where has it been in the U.S. so far? We've seen it's actually been travel imported into many, many states. Um, only a few U.S. territories are sustaining it, so there's local transmission from mosquitoes. Um, and the total case counts are still quite low in the U.S., certainly in, um, in countries like Brazil and other parts of Latin America, we're seeing many more cases. So where is it going, actually? Um, this is a really cool program that some of my colleagues at Eco Health Alliance developed, and it's looking at flight patterns. So you can go back in time and look at patterns over the past few years, and you can also look at scheduled flights and see where passengers are anticipated to travel. So this could be really useful with the Olympics coming up and seeing where people are traveling. And here I just did a scenario um, going from Sao Paulo, which is the, the largest airport in terms of passenger travel per year. And just in a span of a, the, the coming week, we can see where passengers are scheduled to go and really uh, far, far places so they could be carrying Zika virus with them. Um, if those travelers did come into the U.S., as we've seen that they have, where could they actually uh, lead to sustained infection in a mosquito population? Well, this is a great graphic from the CDC, and it shows where uh, here on the left the range of Aedes aegypti is expected to be. So these are the ecological conditions that can support it um, and where it may have been found before. The big disclaimer is that this is not where Zika virus is sustained or, or even has been found, but this is where the mosquito is likely to be, um, be able to survive. Um, Certainly with ecological change and climate change going into the future, this range may change, but this is what's um, anticipated. And here on the right for um, Aedes albopictus, that's another species of uh, mosquito that's thought to transmit it, but is not such a competent host uh, but, or competent vector, but still one to look at. So what is the international community doing about Zika? Well, the World Health Organization has launched um, a big program on this, and there's a lot of funding going towards it, a lot of surveillance, enhanced surveillance, and just as a symptom of, um, or an outcome of enhanced surveillance, we're likely to see more cases just because there's better reporting. Um, response, so helping to provide resources to communities that need them, to women that may, um, may need additional resources if they have complications related to pregnancy from Zika virus, and then research about a potential vaccine. Um, what I think is really critical to highlight here, this is all really important, and this has to be part of the equation, but there's not a lot of research 
research on where it came from and what it can tell us about future epidemics. So some other proposed responses. There was uh, a request to Congress a few months ago for $1.8 billion of emergency funding. And this is notable because um, it was also proposed that some funds that were dedicated to Ebola recovery could be taken and applied to Zika. So, um, you know, that may be detrimental in the long run. We really need to boost capacity in uh, many countries to, to tackle all of these emerging disease threats. There's also been proposals for genetic modifications of mosquitoes, um, and that's somewhat controversial. There's a lot of you know, potential for unintended consequences. It just really warrants a lot more research. Also, uh, proposal of releasing sterile mosquitoes to uh, stop the breeding patterns, and then some other potential um, applications like DDT, which has severe ecological and human consequences too. There's, there's a lot of kind of cost benefit that needs to be done with all of these approaches. Now, if we were here about a year or two ago, we would be talking about a different disease, of course, and the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was totally devastating, um, led to over 11,000 deaths, uh, suspected 28,000 cases, but probably actually much higher. Um, and it's really important to remember with Ebola, humans are not the only species that it, that's affected. And in 2003, my colleagues were investigating an outbreak of Ebola in uh, grade eight populations. And uh, populations of uh, endangered uh, lowland gorillas were found to have Ebola, and this was actually quite devastating. And there were uh, observations of gorillas getting infected when hunters were, uh, hunters would find these dead carcasses. They would stumble upon them. And in some cases, that's seen as really good luck because then you have this, this food source that you have access to. You don't have to, you know, um, to, to hunt it. But that can lead to infection in humans, as we've seen. So this actually presents some really important opportunities because you can use these animals as sentinel monitors. And if you see outbreaks in these animals, you can work with local communities, public health authorities, hunters who may be really the eyes on the ground and park rangers um, and report these potential outbreaks before they, incur, uh, they occur in humans so you can get ahead of them. Now, are we in a new age of emerging diseases? We've seen, you know, we've talked about Zika and Ebola. We've seen a lot of other emerging diseases recently. Um, so it really begs the question, you know, why is this happening now and what is likely to happen in the near future? This actually isn't that, uh, you know, there's actually a historical precedent here. So we know that over 1 billion cases, human cases of disease each year are zoonotic. So they're, they're or originating from animals. Certainly this is not a one-way pathway. Humans can transmit disease to animals. Uh, but these lead to over 1 million human deaths. So really something to think about. Um, and we know that, in fact, almost three-fourths of emerging human pathogens are linked to wildlife. Um, and as we think about disease cycles, you know, endemic diseases are those that are really stable in a, a population. Emerging diseases are new. But if we think of something like HIV, that was only an emerging disease just a few decades ago. And now it's a, a you know, public health pandemic. Um, we're seeing from our research at EcoHealth Alliance that the rate of disease emergence is increasing, so certainly better detection through better surveillance, but also um, absolute uh, disease emergence is increasing. And this is a really complex process. So uh, why is this happening? What are the factors that are leading to it? Well, we can start by looking at these hot spots of disease emergence. And this is based on a data set of all of the emerging diseases uh, from wildlife in the past 60 years. And you see these areas that are red here. These are the areas that are hot for disease. So disease has occurred here in the past. Disease is likely to uh, emerge here in the, in the future as well. And they're really mostly in the tropics. So these are these biodiversity-rich areas, which are often targeted for natural resource development and also have uh, primarily public health poor infrastructure. So there's kind of a lot of different forces here. But this is where we can start to target our surveillance then who, who is, you know, what species are likely uh, to pose a risk to humans? So we can see that taxonomically, bats, rodents, and non-human primates are the ones that have in the past um, led to the most spillover in humans. And now why is this? Well, it's likely um, from the, both the level of contact and also genetic similarity. 
But it's not their fault. <laughs> it really is ours, and I'll tell you why. Um, because we can see that there are these shared drivers of um, disease emergence and biodiversity loss. So these are really distinct drivers, actually, like land use change, food industry changes, and agricultural changes, trade and travel, which then leads to spread of disease, climate change, and these are also the primary drivers of biodiversity loss. So we see uh, that there are these shared drivers, and they can actually be addressed together. So to go in a few of these uh, shared drivers, we can look at the extractive industries. So these are things like timber, oil and gas extraction, mining, uh, palm oil plantations, and these lead to a lot of ecological changes. So roads will often be installed, and this opens up new corridors. Settlements will be uh, formed. There's a lot of, uh, with, with actual extractive industries, you know, there may be um, entrance into caves where there's bat colonies, and then there may also be an increase in hunting for food security. And that's a real challenge because there's often not a food source provided. So without a, a reliable uh, protein source, the workers may have to resort to hunting of wildlife. And these biodiversity hotspots and um, disease emergence hotspots are often the ones that are targeted for natural resource um, extraction. And unfortunately, while we see that social and environmental uh, risk assessments are typically conducted at these sites, health risk assessments are not routinely conducted or they're very superficially conducted. Um, so we don't really know how to anticipate these disease risks. And then what about land conversion for agriculture? We're, to meet these growing food demands of our population, there's a projected 100 million hectares of land that's expected to be converted to farmland um, by 2050. And this is about the size of South Africa, so uh, a big uh, amount of land. And this is expected to lead to habitat fragmentation, and this will ultimately change um, the contact opportunities. You know, these, these fragmented borders will allow for new contact between species, including humans, um, and really fundamentally changing the ecological dynamics. Road infrastructure. So here on the map, these, uh, these kind of lighter areas are the ones that don't have a lot of existing road infrastructure. And there have been a lot of commitments by really well-intentioned entities like the World Bank to establish road infrastructure. And that will certainly come with many benefits and, and assist in economic development in many ways, but it will also open up these really uh, pristine habitat areas for the first time and allow entry. And then we'll expect to see settlements um, along these corridors. And you know, it's just opening up those, uh, those corridors and allowing for both the, the movement of people and their pathogens. And then the use of antimicrobials. We see that in the US, actually, um, two thirds of antimicrobials go to animal agriculture. So we hear a lot about human clinical, clinical medicine and the, the concerns there, but actually the majority is going to animal agriculture and a large portion is, is destined actually for growth promotion. So not even for therapeutics, but for prophylactic use before disease occurs or to boost uh, promotion, uh, growth promotion. We see that this trend is actually anticipated to increase really dramatically uh, throughout the world. And uh, this is concerning because you know, we see that there's this genetic selection for these resistant strains. So we, we, we kill a lot of the bad bacteria, but we leave some and then they, they grow and they, um, we lose our commensal bacteria, our good bacteria. And we don't know about the potential for reversing this resistance. So there's a lot of questions here. And, um, in food production themselves, as we scale up food production and we have more intensive systems, there are many efficiency gains, and there can actually be really good disease control, but with lacking biosecurity or biosecurity that's not up to par with these um, changing food production systems, we see a lot of concern. So there's, there's really high density stocking rates. There's stressful conditions often. These animals um, have very small enclosures. There's typically low genetic diversity. Um, the waste products themselves from these, these uh, production systems may be disseminated into the environment. We don't really know their fate. Um, so there's a lot of different forces going on here. Then the wildlife trade, something that we don't often think about it in the US. Maybe um, you know, we, we hear about it linked to the ivory trade, but there's actually many, many species that are traded um, kind of under the radar. There is a big illegal trade in wildlife, and the US is actually one of the primary consumers of the wildlife trade. 
Um, this is often linked to really crowded, stressful conditions with many different species potentially, which creates this really perfect mixing vessel because you have um, the potential for many animals to be together and uh, there's not a lot of good regulation of this trade. So we just don't know what the risks might be. Um, and certainly it's a route of introduction for invasive alien species. So to look at one example of the wildlife trade and a disease risk here in the US, um, in 2003, there was legal, actually legal importation of African rodents, which um, were carrying monkeypox virus, which then spread to a pet prairie dog in a pet store, which someone brought home, was infected with monkeypox virus, and then infected uh, 46 other humans. Then subsequently, the CDC banned the importation of uh, African rodents and also um, non-human primates and bats, but there's still really uh, lax uh, regulations around the wildlife trade, so we don't necessarily know what the risk is. Then climate change, we hear a lot about this, and I know there's a lot of scholars here um, who are very, uh, very expert in climate change, but we see that cl climate change has the potential to change species ranges, and this is probably over a really long term, several decades, um, over you know the next century, but eventually these may enable suitable conditions for both invasive alien species and their pathogens. And then air, trade, and uh, travel, we can just get around so quickly now. This is a, a diagram of, uh, a map of all the, the different flights um, in a day, and you can see this connectedness. There's just so much, and it's so rapid. So with development, we're seeing these global, uh, glowing, sorry, growing pressures, and this is intensifying our use of natural resources to meet our population demands. This is increasing our contact with wildlife, facilitating disease spillover, and then this really rapid trade and travel uh, enables the potential for spread. So a lot of uh, these drivers of disease are linked to industry. But actually, there's a really important role of industry here, and they can be part of the solution, which I think is quite exciting. So the risks of uh, pandemic disease and epidemic diseases are really uh, of concern to many industry sectors. So with SARS in 2003, we saw that in um, parts of Asia, there were these really uh, dra dramatic market closures. Um, with Marburg virus, there were mining shutdowns in gold mines where uh, workers were infected with Marburg virus. And then H1N1, certainly in Mexico in 2009, there was a really drastic decrease in tourism and in uh, pork production demand. So these industries can be part of the solution. So we can um, look at, you know, when there's a proposed development project, we can look at the cost benefit of the project and not just include the economic outcomes that are typically thought of like, um, you know, uh, the, the profits, but also look at disease as a financial outcome. We can also conduct these coordinated health and impact and social uh, risk assessments and see kind of the links between them and to get a more full picture. And then we can also work with industry to develop standard practices like providing a really reliable food source to relieve wildlife hunting pressures. Now, I know we have some economists in the room, and I'm thrilled for that. Uh, we, we can see that there's a really strong economic cost of disease uh, outbreak argument for getting ahead of them. So just, you know, here we can see SARS is estimated at 30 to $50 billion to the global economy. If Ebola were on here, uh, we could see that, you know, it's really devastated GDP growth and will have really long-term residual economic impacts. So what do we ultimately want to work towards? And this is what my colleagues and I are working on at EcoHealth Alliance. We're trying to get ahead of these human outbreaks and uh, prevent these spillover events. And just to kind of show an example of what this might look like, in 2014, we saw two simultaneous Ebola, Ebola outbreaks, one in DRC and one in West Africa. Now, they of course can't be directly compared, but I think we can take some lessons from the different trajectories of them. Um, so here on the left, we see the case in DRC, which had an existing program to, um, to respond to disease threats really rapidly, to, uh, to detect disease threats and diagnose them. Um, and the outcome was very different than what we saw in West Africa. So having these preventive or early warning systems can be really useful for responding to outbreaks in a timely way and, and um, containing them. And ultimately, you know, we want to get 
ahead of that so there's no outbreak in the first place. But I think this is a really good way forward and a good example of what we might achieve in the near term. Now, we've been talking a lot about zoonotic disease outbreaks, but it's really important to, to also recognize that non-zoonotic disease outbreaks are also important for human health. So with food security, we actually saw that last year there was uh, an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza that led to almost the, the, the culling of almost 50 million animals. So really devastating to uh, the poultry industry, especially in the Midwest. Um, we've also seen that chytrid in amphibians has led to very large-scale die-offs of um, amphibian populations, and wild life trade has been a really important contributor here. And then white nose syndrome in North American bats has uh, led to colony collapse of over 90%. And why are bats important? So we see that they provide this really integral ecosystem service that's free, which is fantastic. And it provides um, a great help to our agricultural industry. And this has actually been estimated at over $3.7 billion in a year in this free ecosystem service. So if we lose these bats, we'll lose this fantastic ecosystem service. And we, so to kind of put it all together, we see that we're really changing the ecological principles um, that are leading to these new disease emergence events, both in, in wildlife and people. So we need a one health approach to get ahead of this. And this is bringing together animal uh, expertise, human expertise, and environmental expertise, but within those, many other sectors, so uh, sociology, uh, earth sciences, veterinary medicine, anthropology, and many, many other sectors to really understand the different dynamics here and address them in an integrated and uh, an efficient way. So I'd like to just talk a little about the work that my colleagues and I at EcoHealth Alliance are doing uh, with many partners, and one uh, one great project is the USAID Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. This was funded in 2009 for a period of five years when, and was actually uh, recently refunded for a second phase. So the first phase was operating in 20 countries that were these hotspots for disease emergence. Um, and we conducted uh, sampling in wildlife, so primarily bats, rodents, and non-human primates, to identify novel pathogens, to you know see where the risk was, to see if we could find out what's there before it emerges in people. Um, and then we refined our global risk maps, like those hotspots of disease emergence maps. Um, the ultimate goal is to know what's out there and reduce the spread, the spillover of new pathogens. Um, so one, one really cool outcome of this was looking at these viral discovery curves. So how many animals do we have to, to sample to find how many viruses they have. So you see here on these curves, I know there's a lot of curves, but if we just look at the kind of general trend, we see that as we collect more samples from a given species, we find more viruses until there's a certain saturation point. And then you can, you can see that you collect about 85% uh, 80, of um, the viral diversity. So there's actually, you know, beyond that, it's maybe not so cost effective. We kind of see the whole picture here, uh, most of the whole picture here. Um, and it's not actually, you know, such immense numbers. So you don't have to sample a million, you don't have to collect a million samples. You can um, actually tailor your sampling to meet these uh, viral discovery uh, saturations. So kind of some outcomes of the PREDICT-1 uh, phase. Over uh, 2.5, sorry, uh, 2,500 persons were trained. So there's a really big emphasis on building capacity in these communities where we're working. And then we sampled many species uh, and uh, yielded 56,000 samples and ultimately found 815 novel viruses. Now, it's really important to note that we don't know if these are all pathogenic. Many are likely not pathogenic to humans, but um, this is you know, helping us to get a, an understanding of what's out there and what might emerge in the future. So the second phase of the PREDICT-2 project has been broadened, and it now involves 32 hotspot countries, including West African countries that were affected by the Ebola outbreak. We're now conducting integrated human, domestic animal, and wildlife sampling to see if there's viral circulation among them, and to also identify those high-risk interfaces where spillover is likely to occur. There's also a behavioral and biological risk surveillance component. So the behavioral component is new and um, really exciting because it has this anthropological uh, link now. And then also evaluating One Health approaches to see if they're cost effective. 
Now, the PREDICT project had you know, this really fundamental goal of getting information to many different ministries to promote this one health approach. Um, so in, in many disease outbreak investigations, you know, the findings may just go to one, uh, one relevant ministry. So if there's a human outbreak, it may just go to the human health ministry. But this project is ensuring that the results go both to um, the human health ministry, but also environmental ministry and agricultural, agricultural uh, ministries. And they're encouraged to interpret the findings amongst themselves and, and you know, see where the synergies are and promote a shared understanding. Now, I've talked a lot about animals, but people are, of course, really important for all of these, um, these problems that we're looking at and also really important for the solutions. So um, the behavioral research and surveillance component is, uh, I think, really exciting because it will give us new answers. Um, and you know, disease surveillance is key, but it only monitors mortality and morbidity. So by understanding human practices that lead to disease spillover, we can find solutions that are acceptable culturally. Um, and this is a really important part of the PREDICT project. Now, another project that I'm working on is uh, the study of Rift Valley fever virus in South Africa. And this was uh, a viral zoonosis that was first detected in Kenya in 1931. And then since then, it's, it's spread um, to parts of, of Africa. Here you can see uh, in the, with the pink where Rift Valley fever has been reported. And then the yellow is where there's a risk of Rift Valley fever. Um, it is an arbovirus, so it's mosquito transmitted. But in fact, um, most human cases occur from uh, direct contact with infected animals. The symptoms are usually very mild and often asymptomatic if, if, uh, with infections, but they can progress to severe symptoms, including viral hemorrhagic fever, although this is quite rare. So why is this relevant? Well, in South Africa, agriculture is really, really important. It's a, it, I think it's the, the third largest industry in South Africa. Um, and during an outbreak in 2010, we saw that there were these communities that were really heavily affected because their animals were having these very large-scale die-offs, but then also the veterinarians and farm workers that were handling, handling these infected animals were also getting sick, and there were, unfortunately, human deaths, too. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense and other U.S. agencies have recognized it as a potential biothreat, and it is vaccine preventable for uh, domestic animals, but there's no vaccine uh, that's licensed, licensed for human use. So we know a lot about the epidemiology in certain countries, like in Kenya, there's a pretty good understanding of um, the, the ecological links and the, the uh, weather-related links. But in South Africa, the transmission cycle wasn't fully understood. And we don't really know what's going on during the inter-epidemic period. So why do we see these kind of sporadic outbreaks? So that's what our study is looking at. Um, and it's a really exciting study because it's a One Health approach, a real true One Health project. So it's bringing together many different partners. Um, so EcoHealth Alliance, but our really key partners in South Africa. So we're working with the National Laboratory System. We're working with the South African um, Defense Ministry, Agricultural Ministry, um, the Sand Parks, which is their wildlife ministry, the South African Weather Service, NASA, and then many other partners um, in the international realm. And we're trying to understand the many different parts of this transmission cycle. So looking at the mosquito vector, but also uh, how it survives in, its, in soil conditions. You know, and, and so we're uh, conducting soil sampling and weather sampling, weather monitoring, and then also looking at uh, risk in animals and in humans. And I'm also involved in the Future Earth Project. And uh, this is an incredible, it's, it's quite new, but I'm really excited about it. And it's an incredible sustainability research platform. And I see some students in the room, and I'm thrilled about that, because this is somewhere that I hope you'll think about getting involved in in your career, um, because it's really meant to bring together different disciplines and uh, work together to solve these very complex global environmental change uh, challenges that we face as a society and that we will face over the coming decades, too. Um, so there is a, a future health project that I manage with my colleagues, but there are also many other areas, so climate sciences, ecosystem services, um, and I encourage you to, to 
learn more about it. I think it's futureearth.org. Now, one area that EcoHealth Alliance and Future Earth are looking at are how to, is how to integrate health and ecological monitoring. And we see that health, uh, health monitoring and ecosystems monitoring are often you know, uh, conducted very differently. There are different systems to record data, different metrics used, so it's really hard to see what's going on um, with both of them and how they're linked. So we're, uh, we're working to understand the complexities on a multiple disease level and look across the gradients um, when there's land use change. So comparing an urban uh, setting and a, a, uh, an area where we see a gradient of change and then a pristine setting and seeing, you know, what are the different ecological dimensions there and how is disease affected um, in these different uh, gradients. And then, of course, to make uh, solutions come, come about, we really need to translate this research into policy. So uh, one really exciting area is that we can use health to leverage, um, you know, solutions that can also address these underlying drivers of environ environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. And we can see that health is really an ecosystem service. We can, we can benefit from ecosystem services um, for health. And in fact, our partners at the Convention on Biological Diversity have been really supportive of this. They're really excited about it, and they see that this is a great way to mainstream biodiversity. If you're interested in these health and biodiversity links, this is a fantastic report that the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the World Health Organization released recently, and it's just a great synthesis of knowledge. And then the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a really exciting commitment that nations and the United Nations have, have made um, to bring together climate action, health, poverty eradication under one heading. Um, and I think, you know, there's many, many synergies to be made here with health um, and many pro progress on many other development issues. Now, the public is really important too. There's a lot that we can do in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so this is one example of an EcoHealth Alliance program. We, we you know, really um, are focused on research, but we also want to provide ways that the public can engage. And if you're thinking of buying an exotic pet, please go to this website. Um, it contains really, really interesting information. It can give you information about the sustainability of potential pet purchases, the invasion threat, the ease of care, and then health risks. So uh, refer to your friends to it if, if they're buying a, if they're thinking of buying a, um, a, a pet, and always buy captive, captive bread. Um, then some really cool tools that you can use if you'd like to learn more. So Health Map is great. It, it compiles different sources of information and maps them so you can see where outbreaks occur are occurring in real time. And then Flu Near You, you can actually go on and report. So this is uh, really a great way to kind of engage the public in reporting these and boost you know, the, the type of information, the amount of information that we can get in surveillance. ProMed is a phenomenal resource, so if you are looking for a resource to stay kind of up to date with emerging diseases, this is a great, great resource, um, completely free, and it takes rumor reporting from different news sources, but also from World Health Organization and, and other really credible news sources um, and uh, health, health resources, and then actually provides commentary on them. So you can see these expert moderators that interpret them um, and provide further guidance. So to kind of bring everything together, we see that with these disease outbreaks, there are a lot of really complex dynamics. So we have ecological factors that we need to understand. We have evolutionary biology factors that we need to understand, and then also transmission factors. To really understand all of these in a coordinated way and find coordinated solutions, we have to bring together many different disciplines. So what are some of the benefits of doing that? And at EcoHealth Alliance, we have a lot of different expertise areas. And I think that's such a, a benefit because we can address things in new ways um, and find a lot of solutions that wouldn't be readily apparent with one discipline. So just you know, to give some examples, with economists, we can look at the cost effectiveness of different um, control programs and look at cost savings, which then can be an argument for policymakers. Physicians have a really important role in, in reporting unusual cases and thinking you know, that there may be potentially a link to, animal, um, to an animal when we see these new, um, new diseases or unexpected diseases. 
anthropologists, that's so key, you know, to actually look at the behavioral risk factors and find acceptable solutions. And um, I hope that, you know, you will talk with your classmates and your friends and colleagues about some other ways uh, to bring in additional disciplines. So just to sum up, what's the added value of this more preventive approach that helps us to preempt these disease outbreaks like, you know, going forward? Um, you know, we, we can see that optimal surveillance programs will help us get ahead of these threats. Um, we can identify risks and then prioritize solutions and uh, control options. To do this, we really need interdisciplinary data, so not just human health, but also wildlife health, anim uh, domestic animal health. And then we need to interpret this information across different disciplines. And then this will help us promote global health security because with this era of global trade and travel that's so rapid, we're only as strong as really our weakest link. So we really need to boost global health security uh, throughout the world. And uh, I think that there will be a really good argument for cost savings and that we can get policymakers, decision makers to invest in this. But um, I hope you'll all join me in that mission. So thank you very much. Can I take questions? Is that okay? Great. Yes. But, or comments? Any ideas? <laughs> oh, I've got a question. Have you done or are you thinking of doing anything with the antivirus? Yes. So, antivirus is really interesting, and it's actually there's pretty good evidence that there's a link to both climate, but also to habitat fragmentation. Um, but there's kind of sporadic cases in the US and the Southwest. Um, some of my colleagues work a lot on it, but um, it, you know, I think it's not so much in the media because it is more sporadic. We've seen it before, uh, but it's kind of one of those persistent challenges that we have to grapple with and um, we'll probably see more of as land is converted more. Um, but yeah, do you... We live in the south of Chile. Oh, okay. And, and there's a very, very important amount of habitat loss and there's a lot of cases down there. Is there, is there any, any one where we could get information from? Absolutely. Or maybe, maybe, maybe uh, help to bring people together or do a study down there? Absolutely, yeah, we can, we can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on Zika virus with the upcoming Olympics? So. It's a big challenge. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, you know, Nina and I were talking about this earlier, and there's in in kind of these mass gathering situations. There's a you know rightly there's there's concerns, but I know in uh, 2013 2014 we were expecting a really concerning situation with MERS and the Hajj uh, with with people going to Mecca, and fortunately. Concerns didn't play out as expected, so there were not there was not this big increase in infections. You know, there was certainly really good capacity on the ground. I think they, the government uh, was really preparing for that potential uptick, so they had very good surveillance and uh, potential um, supportive therapy. But fortunately, there was not a big catastrophe. But I think it's you know people should really heed those travel warnings and be aware and know the risk. Um, and you know, use preventive strategies, um, but it's it's really hard to tell. We can certainly predict, you know, passenger uh, inflow to the Olympics and what the and passengers leaving um, from those areas. But there's a lot of unknowns as of now. Yes, thank you so much. And the DRC, you know, that's one of the poorest nations in the world. So I, I'm encouraged that the program there could work and, and intervene early. Um, the program, there's a really, really strong lab um, at INRB. And this is the, the lab that we work with PREDICT, so with the PREDICT project. So we have um, good you know, capacity in place. There was a lab that was really functioning very well. Um, there were the, the proper uh, diagnostic protocols. They had the resources they needed. But it's, it's you know, challenging. If you don't have that, even like the electricity source, many labs 
will have great equipment, but they often won't have the capacity to run them, or will have intermittent, you know, power source, or um, they won't have all the the, the functioning kind of um, baseline resources that you need to run a lab. So, fortunately, in DRC they did have that, but um, that that's really um, a long-term commitment to providing those resources. And in many other countries, there's not that strong baseline capacity, um, and you know, I think it, it worked for Ebola because Ebola had been seen before there, too. So there was some level of what to do. You know, people knew what to do. Um, but, you know, we really want to get ahead of that in the future. And DRC is one of the predict countries. Um, so there's a good team on the ground there. But it's true. So a lot of these countries have really challenged baseline public health systems. And there's a lot of capacity needs that need to be brought up to speed before we can preempt these diseases really fully. Great, great talk. All of the EIDs, the line tends to go up over time, or has recently. Can you comment on the impact of either detection or reporting bias as, as contributing to some of that? So it certainly has contributed to a lot of it, but still the absolute number, even with adjusting for reporting bias and surveillance bias, um, there's still an absolute increase. Um, you know, I think we can expect to see more when we look for it, and that's good because we can start to get a really solid baseline. Um, but, you know, it, it's been really, uh, actually even with Zika virus, a lot of the cases uh, that were seen, there were probably many more that were missed, you know, leading up to 2015, because it's very clinically similar to dengue, um, even to yellow fever. It can actually cross-react with um, some of the diagnostic tests. So there may have been uh, testing for it, and it just wasn't picked up. You can also have co-infection. So they may have detected another virus, but Zika was also uh, co-occurring. So the surveillance, there's, there's a really drastic need to boost surveillance and get a strong baseline. Um, but the evidence suggests that even beyond increased reporting and uh, surveillance and detection, um, there's a, an absolute increase. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, it's a great question, and that's really a symptom of that surveillance, you know, where we have strong surveillance system in, in places, uh, in place, so we see that, and I'm just scrolling back to it, sorry that I have so many slides, um, but in places like New York City, we have a lot of trade and travel, uh, so there's somewhat better surveillance because, you know, we kind of expect that um, we may see diseases from many other places. So there's there's kind of, we're, we're a little more um, able to look for it and detect it. So New York here is, is a hot spot, but that's because there is capacity to detect it, but it may be travel imported. So this is really the, the first report of a disease. So, um, you know, many diseases probably have emerged in other places and then they were reported in Germany or, the, you know, in New York City. Um, so this is, there's actually a new version of this coming out, which is a little more refined. And my colleagues can actually look now at a five kilometer scale. So it's a little more precise. And as we have better data, of course, this will become more um, able to be targeted. And then you can look at those specific hotspots. And, um, and what I think this map is really helpful for is then we can look at the specific drivers that are occurring in, in these countries. So what is it? So in the US, certainly trade and travel we see, but in some of these um, more uh, mid-latitude countries, you know, extractive industries. So we can look at a country level um, and start to find solutions. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Um, certainly a one health approach is going to require sort of an all hands on deck approach. And working across uh, many different partners. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about in some of the countries where you're working, some of the other partners, sort of beyond even the ministries of health, sort of at that level, but if there are other academic institutions or other NGOs, other partners on the ground that you're working with to build capacity, maybe contribute or partner with for some of the research that you're doing. 
Yes, it's a fantastic question. And there are so many players that are a part of the solution and such important parts of the solution. Um, and I should mention that this work wouldn't be possible without the, the coordination and the excellent effort of many partners on the ground, hundreds of partners, but then also their networks, um, the local universities that have the capacity to um, you know, really work on the ground and, and they're out in the field at these very remote sites and um, they're really doing the hard lifting. Um, but yes, absolutely. So hunters have been an incredible resource. You know, they're the ones on the ground. They're seeing these uh, these wildlife in in the forest. They can really help with biodiversity surveys too because they're um, observing the different species. But then when they see a carcass or a sick animal, they can report that. So can park rangers. Um, so they can really be our eyes and ears where we're we're not able to be on the ground every day. Um, Many other partners, there's actually a really interesting example from China where we're working with, um, his name is Mr. Wei, and he's a, a wildlife farmer. So it's somewhat controversial, but um, it is intended to relieve pressures on wild populations and um, that are being sought for often food. Um, so he has a farm with porcupine and bamboo rats and some other species. Now, we're, we're looking at uh, the disease risk in his, his animals and seeing if there's because we get, there's a more controlled environment, do you actually have a lower disease risk? The results are not yet available, but I think that's a it's a potential alternative, and you really need some of those creative solutions. Um, so uh, there's so many other many many sectors where um, we need to work with, and and you know, please uh, bring those those ideas to light, and in in your work, you know, think about them and, and talk about them with your colleagues. I think it's a great opportunity. Talked about identifying these, these new viruses from from wildlife. Is there any way to determine their potential uh, effect on humans without infecting the, the humans? So there is. It's it's. There's no specific way to determine zoonotic potential. It's a great question, uh, but we have some signs. So if it's from um, a viral family where we've seen really highly pathogenic diseases before, so one example could be with filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg virus. Uh, if we find related viruses there, that that's of concern. You know, we'll want to look more at that really closely. Um, and then you can look at some. Um, some of the spike proteins, actually, you can see if, if those um, might be pathogenic, but it's still really challenging. You know, there's not uh, a great way to do that. My colleagues are working really hard in the lab and trying to determine that, but it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to interpret these findings. Um, and that makes it really important for that coordinated interpretation because you don't want to have one sector see these findings and interpret it, uh, you know, with with concern if it's not warranted, and maybe go ahead and um, take take action that's not warranted. So you really have to kind of have a, a as Dr. Adams very eloquently said, have an all hands on deck approach that brings different disciplines to the table and and helps to understand the challenges, helps to understand what information is known and what information is not known and needs to be researched further. Um, but I think they're useful for seeing what what's out there, and we can start to get a sense of you know what are the general trends, um, what do we need to look a little more closely at. Um, but so you're basically cataloging the viruses by by family. Would you give us an idea of the universe of, of viruses that are, are we looking at? At millions, uh, hundreds of thousands, or so from this, let's see if I can bring it back. Um, from this analysis of viral saturation, we saw that for one species, there's an estimated, um, it's about, sorry, and I'll go back to, yeah. So it's, uh, with this specific Indian flying fox, Teropis, we see that there's about 58 viruses, give or take. Um, when we extrapolate that to all mammals, we see that there are an estimated it's around 320,000 viruses, mammalian viruses. Many of those are not pathogenic to humans, of course, um, but we can start to get a scale, you know, a sense of scale. Um, and I, 
there was an estimate of how much money it would cost to detect the majority of those. It was around $1.4 billion. If we want to detect all of them, it increases a lot. I think it was around $6 billion. Um, but it's not, it, you know, that's still in the realm of being less than one of these major outbreaks, costing less to the global economy. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do with, with somewhat you know, limited resources that we see in public health often. I think there's a lot we can do to learn more about what's out there and start to get ahead of them. But this is definitely, this is the first step. You know, we, we this is helping us to understand what's out there and it, it doesn't give us the full picture, but it's a start to look at the baseline. A number of the hotspot areas that you showed are also areas that have high rates of human trafficking. Do you know what kind of efforts there are to monitor uh, victims that are rescued from human trafficking? That's a, it's a great question, and thank you for bringing that up. And I'm not too familiar with that uh, area of research, but it's a really, really important one. Uh, we certainly see that human migration is, uh, you know, humans move and they bring their pathogens with them. So I, I hope that you'll look more in, into that and keep me posted on what you find. Thank you. Other questions? Well, thank you. And if you have other questions or comments, please, please come talk to me. It was really an honor to be here. And thank you so much for your interest.